or do I need to? Just come in, you can change your admin name. Well, I can say entra senza video, but now it's done. Recording in progress. Just a minute. Turn the sound.
Hello. Oops, uh, Richard, I, let me just check. I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Perfect. Okay. Morning. Morning there. So we're we just uh, setting up the slide, the introductory slide. There is an echo as well that you're in, just so you know. Yeah, okay. And let me just check if I could choose a virtual background okay So can you see me okay now? Uh, there is there is a spelling mistake on my name, just you know, on that slide. <laughs> so I think, well, you can- Oh, no, I later. see it, no, I see it. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. <laughs> don't, don't. As long as, well, I think in, in my background is fine, actually. It's very strange. Well, well, we'll only have this up for a moment just while we're waiting for people to join. That's fine. Um, and the other thing you might want to do, uh, Siraj, is just put your contact details in the chat. I've done that already, um, okay. if, if you want to. Yes, of course. So I can't see it. I can't see your details. Have really? you put them? In the chat, yeah. I said me to everyone. It's not there. I can't see them. Can you see them? Yeah, I see them. <laughs> That's really I don't know. Yeah. Well, I might put them in again when you're uh, when you're talking. So if I were to do them now, let, let's just have a look. So I would say hosts and panelists. No, it's uh, uh, to everyone. To, to everyone, okay. To everyone. Uh, Sit on shake. Email. Can you see it now? Yes, come up perfectly, but you can't see mine. I can't see yours. There is an echo, Richard, just so you know at your end. No, it's okay, that, that'll be solved when we go live. It's just I've got a local machine I need to keep on here. Uh, so. so we're just playing with the uh, with the background screen at the moment. Yeah, if you can hide hide the name, <laughs> that might help. I'm just saying. Well, we don't need to use it at all if uh, if that's easier. I'm just saying that I think it. Uh, it's distracting. People will pick up. Potentially. Okay. Uh, oh, there was an original screen, wasn't there? The one that was used in LinkedIn. Maybe that that one could be used as a background. Uh, uh, Hang on a second, how much time have we got? Let me just, um, no, let's just leave it like this. It's going to be too complicated to be, to be honest. Uh, That's fine. So, no sorry about that. Anyway, it's, it's correct. Is, is mine the right way around? Because it appears not. My, my uh, background, I mean, the name. Yeah. Is... It is to me, yes. I think you, you, sometimes you have an option to mirror your screen. So maybe you've got that on. Let me just. Uh... See, not that it matters, given that I know who I am, <laughs> but you know what I mean, it's just slightly, 
Has that changed it for you? No. Okay, it's changed it for me. So just in terms of where I where I sit. Great. Okay. Well, um, we've got, we had 102 registrations. No. Oh. Um, there are. No, I've lost my list. I had it in my hand just then. Oh, here it is. Um, I think because of a friend of mine in the Balkans, there are a lot of people here from uh, from that region, um, from the Adriatic in particular. Um, there are people from the Middle East. Well, I, sorry, I'm judging from names, obviously, because most of these people I don't know. Please do. That's fine. Um, <laughs> but <I'll, laughs> um, there's lots of Lukovic's and uh, oh, there's a Sinclair in there. Mitya Tramputs, Jambrak, Bajramovic, Kuric, Fligic, uh, Sprinkling, very few Brits, interestingly. Um, there's some people I know from Croatia, from Hungary, Central Europe. Um, and then Zishan Malik, do you know that name? Uh, I, I, I know many Zishans, I'm afraid I can't, yeah. Which one it is? There's um, yes. an Mbanugo, who presumably is, is from Africa. Temor Zadeh, Kurosh Temor Zadeh, Atlantica Global, Ali Haider. Uh, sorry, I'm just going at random. Some people from That's Dubai fine. that I know. Said Khalid Shah Bukhari. No, I, I don't know. Hassan Al Sukari, who's an Egyptian, I know him. Um, some Hungarians, more people from Dubai. Um, there's an Iranian that I know. Esma Kalir, I think, is a colleague of yours. I don't know. No. Okay. There are many people who know me that I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, Richard. Ayhan Evren, who presumably is Turkish by the. Yeah. By the Anyway, we'll see how many people actually turn up, because I always, uh, at this point, try and put a, a hatch on everything by saying I spoke at the um, Digital Leaders in a thing like this, I think it was two years ago now, and I had um, 89 registries, registra registries, anyway, uh, people registered. And um, when we started the webinar, there was zero audience. So at this point, you have a cup of tea and go home. <laughs> right. I'll go for it. Okay. I should prepare for that then. Shall I, shall well, I put you, the kettle on? No, <laughs> the, the trouble is, Raj, you never know. You can, exactly. have, a, you can have a big number registered, um, you know, 130, 140 register and 20 turn up. I think it just depends what's happening on the day and whether people remember and all those, all those sorts of things. But um, anyway, we need to be optimistic. Yeah, and you were happy with the running order. I was, yes. I've got it in front of me now. I'm just quickly running through it. I, 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 I will switch it off. I mean, in terms of I'll just follow you, Richard, if that's okay. I have a mental structure in my mind that we've spoken about a couple of times, which has helped. Yeah. So um, feel free to, if there's anything I'm blatantly ignoring or something, feel free to just, you know, prompt it. Uh, but I, yeah. I think it's really a, a question just of... Um trying to point up the unique selling point in, in what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and if we can try and hammer that a couple of times. Um, exactly. And then presumably I should end up by saying something like, you know, if any of you are interested in hearing more about this uh, work that Siraj has developed, um, our email addresses are in, oh, is mine? Sorry, I didn't put it in the chat again. Let me. Uh... I, I, I can't see yours, yeah. Um, perhaps people only get to see it when they start joining. Is that is that a possibility? I don't know. Um, what I will do at 11, which is two minutes now, um, Siraj, can you see the chat now? Yes, I can see your uh, emails. Yes, your, your contact details, that's right. Okay, what I will do at 11 o'clock is um, just say, uh, hello everybody, I'm just gonna give a couple more minutes for late joiners to have the chance to arrive. 
and then I suggest if you and I go on mute because at this point we will be live. Once I, I don't know if you've got the button on your screen, but I've got the start webinar screen at the top, which I've learned from bitter experience not to press until it is the correct moment. Uh, I, I don't have that. I uh, know. That's. I think that's because I'm in control. No, once um, uh, every panelist had it. I think this was an earlier version of Zoom, and we were sort of 20 minutes off starting and having a chat among ourselves and somebody inadvertently pushed the start webinar and it meant right. that our chat was being broadcast to uh, everybody who was joining, which right. wasn't, wasn't necessarily what we wanted. Fair enough, okay. But this is the, um, I think the eighth in the series of Oxford Cyber Webinars. So I'll talk a little bit about those and uh, try and boost our audience for future ones. And do they get recorded? Do you yes. provide recordings? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. That's fine. Um, what I've done in the past, I need to talk to um, our guy in Oxford. Uh, probably the best way is to post the link on the website for OCA. But I, in any case, I always put them on my YouTube channel. So um, perfect. I can't say it's heavily visited, but at least I know where they are. I've got them all together. All right, I'll go on mute now. Okay, me too. We're almost at the magic witching hour. Hi everybody and welcome to this Oxford Cyber Academy webinar dealing with disaster. Um, it's exactly the moment when we should be starting but just to give late arrivals uh, time to log in I'm going to give a couple more minutes and then we'll start. So two more minutes please and then we'll be ready to start. or so just to give uh, everybody a chance to log in. And um, particular welcome to uh, several old friends and colleagues I see from all over Europe and also from the Middle East and Africa. So thanks very much for joining us today for this, this webinar. Um, as usual on these webinars, just a couple of housekeeping points. Um, this webinar is being recorded and as usual with Oxford Cyber Academy, we'll make the recording available later um, on our website. So you'll be able to catch up on anything that you feel you missed or that you wanted to hear again. Um, as usual, again, on these webinars, please make good use of the Q&A and the chat. Um, I'll try and keep my eye on any particular questions that seem relevant to what we're talking about um, as we go along, um, and then introduce those questions into the, uh, into the discussion. Uh, let's try and keep this as interactive as possible, please. And the plan will be that um, Siraj and I will talk probably for about 40, 45 minutes 
um, and then we'll throw uh, the floor open for, for personal discussion. Um, first of all, to say a few words about myself, I'm Richard Knowlton, Director of Security Studies at the Oxford Cyber Academy. Um, I've been involved in corporate security now for about um, 15, almost 20 years, I'm sorry to say. Um, first of all, in security director roles in financial services and then in telecommunications. But over recent years doing consultancy work, I've also been working uh, with a whole range of companies from uh, aerospace, aviation, oil and gas, and so on. So quite a broad experience of the issues that can arise uh, when cyber crises happen. A few words about this Oxford Cyber Academy webinar series. Um, the whole idea of them is that they're a, a fireside chat. There are, there's no slides, there's no formality. What I try to do is to bring together colleagues and friends to have really an informal discussion of current issues and challenges in cybersecurity. They're really a central part of Oxford Cyber Academy's mission, which we as see as to identify and share experience and best practice through teaching, seminars, research, and consultancy. This webinar today, Dealing with Disaster, is the snappy title we've given it, is the eighth in our current series. And we're going to look at the practical issues we face in managing cyber incidents. I'm delighted to be joined by my friend and colleague, Professor Siraj Ahmad Sheikh from Coventry University for this conversation. So Siraj, please tell us something about your background and how you came to be interested in this field of, of cyber crisis management. Um, thank you, Richard. And uh, once again, thank you for inviting me uh, for this opportunity as well. I just want to say morning and afternoon to um, all the participants. Um, so um, I have a, a, an academic, predominantly an academic background for almost uh, 22, 23 years now where I've worked at the interface of security and safety uh, kind of critical systems. But particularly my focus has been around um, what we would call cyber defense and more and more moving on to cyber resilience. So I think one of the key challenges, Richard, around technology and fundamental science is that as the field progresses, there are imperatives on um, issues around adoption and sharing of that knowledge for, um, you know, to, towards industry and, and for wider consumption. And the last 10 years or so, that's been very clear to me um, how organizations who are increasingly adopting technology and relying on the digital infrastructure and having more data assets are then able to better um, react and respond to uh, cyber threats. And that's in light of the increasing complexity of kind of the, the threat landscape as well. So my job really has been to be not just at the technical end, but sit at that interface where I could address issues like risk perception, uh, address issues around incident kind of management and so on. So in a sense, it's been very organic for me as a background to then follow into uh, what some of the themes that we'll touch on today. So hopefully that helps and then I can uh, kind of, you know, carry on. One of the things just to mention, I also wear a second hat. I'm co-founder and chief scientist at CyberOwl, which is um, about seven years old now as a cybersecurity uh, startup. Uh, so we are a um, maritime security company where we look at IT, OT assets on vessels, uh, maritime vessels, and look at their uh, detection and monitoring. So that's given me some insight, some first-hand kind of insight into not just that adoption of technologies, but also, also of course, how organizations in that particular sector and related sectors kind of look at, um, you know, incident response. So we'll, we'll, we, we, we can come touch on some of those insights hopefully today. That's great, uh, Siraj. And uh, you touched a chord when you talked about organic development, because when I came into corporate security, as I said before, getting on for 20 years ago, crisis events were almost always about physical happenings, floods, fires, earthquakes, war, civil unrest, and, and large-scale thefts, even in one case. I've experienced all of those, but the large-scale theft um, doesn't sound as if it should be significant, but in fact, it blacked out um, a large swathe of a particular local market in the company uh, where I was working. But obviously, digital transformation has brought, as you said, a whole new set of risks that are simply qualitatively and, and quantitatively different. And first of all, they're not limited by geography, apart from anything else. Um, you were unlucky if you had floods in multiple countries. 
There's also the, the, the targeting aspect, a high risk of targeted repeated attacks by highly sophisticated actors, which have got you know, very severe consequences for bottom line and reputation. And then we're thinking about this, I think, particularly in the context of Ukraine, that, that risk of deliberate sabotage, particularly in critical national infrastructure, CNI, uh, when there are times of international tension. So I think we've seen over the last 10 years and less, every company is at risk and every board and executive committee has, has got to be planning uh, at all levels to manage a cyber incident. I was going to say when it occurs, but uh, it is when, not if, unfortunately. And that really requires a major cultural shift, I think, from the old days. When we would talk about floods, fires, and earthquakes, um, as far as senior management was concerned, uh, risk management was an operational issue. It wasn't a strategic matter. Whereas these days, of course, uh, the implications of a cyber attack can be really serious uh, across the whole business of, of a company. And uh, forgive me, I wanted to um, talk just very briefly uh, about a latest uh, British government publication that came out um, the Cyber Security Breaches Survey. Um, it's been coming out every year for six years now, uh, which means that we've got a little bit of historical perspective from the, from the data. Um, it basically looks at the policies, the processes, and the approaches to cybersecurity for business charities and educational institutions. And for those of you on the call, I think it's actually the majority who are not British. I'd be really interested to hear if um, your governments are publishing similar data and where we could access it. So please, if you've got uh, access to any of that sort of information from your own country, um, please uh, put some details on the chat and we'll be very interested to, to follow up on that. But just to quote a few stats from the, the latest report, because it was published just two days ago in the UK, um, and it looks at a, a, a series of issues around board engagement, for example. It tells us that there continues to be a low level of board understanding of cyber risks and a general tendency to outsource management of these risks to various actors outside the company, might be insurance companies, specialist service providers, and of course, internal cybersecurity experts as well. But specific stats interested me because I've been following this, as I say, for six years and, and progress, frankly, is glacial. 82% um, of businesses, 82%, say that cybersecurity is a high priority for their senior management. Now, on the face of it, that looks quite good because in 2016, when these things started, it was 69%. So there's a 13% increase. 50% of businesses update their senior management on cybersecurity at least quarterly. But only 19% of British businesses have a formal incident management plan. So progress, but I still see a couple of significant buts that I always focus on. I'm always interested to discuss them with people. Um, there are currently more than two and a half million active companies in the UK. So if you translate the stats that I've just mentioned into hard numbers, it means that well over half a million active companies in the UK don't regard cybersecurity as a high priority. And the second but, of course, is how far that high priority is actually being translated into effective action. It's easy enough um, for a senior manager responding to a questionnaire to say that our management gives a high priority to cybersecurity. But what does that actually mean in, in practice? And here, Suraj, it would be interested to hear your comments on the research that, that you've done. No, thank you, uh, Richard. Just, just one thing just to say on those numbers. I think... Um, uh, there is de there's definitely increasing awareness amongst the management um, and we see that in the roles and um, the the kind of ownership that is being placed in terms of CTOs and CISOs and so on but it still is only just beginning in terms of the understanding uh, of how we manage with those uh, you know manage those incidents and what then how uh, you know are the, the the key kind of dynamic the dynamics of our responses to it and how mature we are. So we, coming back to the project, um, we um, a few years ago um, worked on an initiative led by uh, University College London, also involved Reading University and a few other industry partners, uh, partly funded by the National Cybersecurity Center here in the UK and Lloyd's Register Foundation, to look at uh, the cyber readiness for boards. And the idea of readiness was one to understand the awareness 
but also where perhaps boards see the key challenges, where there are, there are key challenges. And for me, the key part there was to reach out to boards, particularly around um, uh, in sectors that are in transport, um, energy, um, and a number of those who would use Internet of Things or cyber physical systems, and so are concerned with security of safety critical systems, as it were. And for, for me to understand that they've had a lot of experience in safety and manage, management of safety incidents, but are they mature enough in security as well? And so we wanted to really reach out to uh, certain boards and senior management uh, teams and to engage them in certain scenarios where we could then kind of uh, gauge how they would react to a scenario and how they would you know rehearse a strategy that they would have so that has a number of elements which i will go into some detail but the key objective for us there richard was uh, really to also test out the methodology that we had put together so one of the key challenges here is that there is there is wider understanding you know across the piece in terms of you know the need for raising awareness for end users and for man management private sectors and public sectors and so on but what are the tools and methods do we use to 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 do that in some rehearsable repeatable um, kind of effective fashion and so our research really has that at the very core heart of it so we've we've made some progress and i'll very happy to you know, kind of share some of those insights. Uh, and of course, we've, you and I have worked together on, on some of that. So, so yeah, that was the key objective for us to kind of work with the private sector and to understand how we can best address that um, element of awareness, but also the readiness around uh, cyber risk. It's, um, it's interesting to hear you talk about the emphasis in the old days on safety. That's something I came across in the context of operational control systems in the days when, of course, um, safety was regarded as something that was uncontroversial and why would anybody ever want to compromise the safety of the company? Um, unfortunately, we've had to move on uh, from those halcyon days, um, not least, as I said, in operational control systems, uh, when, uh, when uh, it, in the old days, um, for example, uh, the sort of software that was being used was uh, software put in place, not designed to be touched uh, for years, but just to run quietly in the background all the time, uh, no updates desired and all of that kind of thing, which uh, inevitably in, in a modern context uh, leads to all sorts of dangerous um, situations. And the way in which IT and OT um, have had to start working together has created some challenges, but perhaps that's a, that's a side way that we didn't ought to walk down at the particular moment. D tell me a little bit more about the, um, the, the research and particularly the, the findings that you evolved from that. Uh, from the research that. so thank you so so in terms of the approach um our approach was very much looking at how we uh, craft scenarios that are relevant to the sector and these scenarios are tabletop uh, artifacts really uh, richard where they just serve a purpose of drawing people into and getting their focus and attention on a certain development which is essentially around an incident a st incident that initially may appear um, very um, kind of low impact, but ultimately then evolves into, you know, towards a more serious impact, a serious risk to the organization and to wider stakeholders. And so using, using the scenarios, we incited those discussions and we engaged the audience in terms of understanding of risk ownership. So what internally, uh, you know, uh, roles that are in the organization, that are best placed or allocated that element of kind of response around certain risks so for financial risks it may be different for technological risks for other risks and so on it will be a different element and then we also uh, used a business risk classification to help um, kind of the audience characterize those scenarios from a business risk perspective. So this is an important point here, Richard, which, which I think you alluded to earlier on as well. I think the senior management and boards want to be able to understand at the position that they're placed, um, the risk to the business. So technology very often is an enabling factor 
to some business function or a product or a service. And for them to understand where certain types of developments and incidents, I should say, um, cyber incidents would pivot into um, some business risk that they have not foreseen. And because these services uh, and inf digital infrastructure and data sets are new. So let me give an example. Data theft um, in terms of whether it's customer data could lead on to significant liabilities. So some of that is obvious from GDPR, but some of it is not obvious as to how that data is then uh, uh, perhaps stolen and then facilitate a whole kind of a, uh, a sectoral issue. So we've seen this with the airlines, with the aviation sector, um, you know, where some of the major airlines have been affected and so on. So just raising that kind of um, attention and then pointing to a number of different business risk categories. So there were about six categories that we looked at, Richard. One was financial, of course. One was around governance. And I think business governance of risk, of all kinds of risk, is a key factor for the shareholders and investors, for them to have confidence that the business is able to manage that. Environmental risks, and we cannot ignore that, increasingly so. That should be on the agenda alongside, um, you know, um, you know what sectors the businesses are particularly in transport and energy uh, manufacturing the environmental risks are high uh, or, the, uh, or, or the the consciousness is high and then there are more uh, technical risks that are essentially around how a certain incident may pivot into uh, certain other areas of of the business which may be undermined so how essentially the threat actor moves across the organization laterally. So one area of exposure could then enable, could then lead on to other areas being undermined. And once again, the management needs to understand the, the level of interconnectivity in the organizations. And I think this is one of the purposes of our scenarios as well. Um, and then there are, of course, uh, legal kind of risks in terms of compliance um, and in terms of external kind of, you know, regulation and standards and compliance issues that may be separate from governance and may be separate from financial. So, so in the safety critical industries, there may not be financial liabilities as such, but it may be just that the license is revoked for an organization to operate, which then would lead on to other risks and so on. Um, and I think the, the, the total um, set of risks coming together for each scenarios as they evolve, it gives a very insightful um, picture to a business audience who are then able to rehearse how they would manage an incident as those risks arise. At what point do some of those risks are well understood and perhaps there are existing mechanisms in place. Perhaps they have encountered those risks before. Perhaps there are sectoral best practices that are there or sectoral norms that organizations are comfortable with in terms of managing those certain risks and where some of those risks are completely new. And so in the work that we did with the organizations that we worked with, we realized that there were internal tensions as well as to how perhaps um, uh, the, the ownership would sit depending on the cat depending on how they would categorize a certain risk because technology and as i said and mentioned is largely an enabling factor for a lot of the businesses it may come under the category of a straightforward an asset uh you know as a service or a tangible material asset and if that's compromised somehow, then does that fall under governance? Does that fall under financial kind of internal risks just to manage in terms of asset management and so on? So there are these interesting tensions and many organizations are now just grappling with it. And our approach, so, so one reflection on our uh, method, Richard, was that the method helps very much people to discover and explore uh, in a comfortable setting, in a setting where they're not faced with something imminent. This is something that they can plan for. And so they're relaxed in that sense. But equally, 
what is important is that we were trying to give them the space to explore and be creative and to look for alternatives. So the method allows for that to happen in a comfortable setting, but in a, in a way where we are pushing the boundaries. We are pushing them to look at scenarios where there are a mix of state, non-state actors. So this is something else to consider for a lot of businesses. I mean, in the current climate, unfortunately, what's happening in Ukraine, what we see is that businesses may be targets not because they are involved directly on the one or the other side, but they may be a mere supplier to some other uh, organization, and they may be just be an easy target, uh, you know, for exploitation, which may then ultimately result in some disruption. So those that complexity, the level of kind of technical adoption now, so we see increasingly. Um, the integration of safety and security kind of uh, systems. We see autonomy in various forms. Uh, and so we see a number of these elements that I think uh, make it quite difficult for us to assess those risks. And that's why that exploration is very important uh, for organizations. And so, so, so far, I would like to think that we are very successful in highlighting um, those to the to the particular clients that we worked with uh, but there is more to be done there so one of the things that we need to do more of and perhaps i can come back to the towards the end is how do we make this method useful internally useful for organizations to become a kind of a a, a ritual where every time there's a strategic shift of some kind and they are formulating their strategy, they have some mechanism to rehearse their strategy and to establish a benchmark where they say, if we are able to be comfortable against this set of scenarios, then we feel comfortable that, you know, if and when, I should say, an incident happens, we can then rehearse. And equally, we could, we could push on the scenarios based on the sectoral uh, or the market demands where the organization may evolve as well. So, so yeah, there are a number of factors there that we could play with. But in a, in a summary, in a nutshell, that's, that's the key insight and the key approach uh, for us. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Very, very interesting. And as you said earlier, I had the chance to, to work with you on one of these exercises with a, with a major multinational uh, in Europe uh, about a year ago. And uh, it was fascinating to see how it played out. I think a number of things uh, occurred to me. The first one uh, was the way in which you spend quite a lot of preparatory time with the company concerned, uh, really to understand their, their context, their preoccupations, and then a little bit of how they were structured in terms of how they might approach management of a major uh, cyber event. And, and the second observation for that brings me right back to my, my corporate security experience which is that uh, inevitably in any company, and particularly a big one, there's a lot of politics around ownership of risks and who's going to do what. Um, and these are issues which are quite sensitive in companies. So being able to discuss them, as you said, in an unthreatening environment uh, where a number of uh, successive scenarios are being introduced um, means that perhaps in, in conversations after the exercise and after we've left um, can actually be resolved to create a a better context um, for, for managing the crisis in the, in, in the first place. Because um, I, one of the difficulties, I, and I always remember this, uh, is uh, conducting crisis management exercises is one thing. Everybody says they're a good thing, we should do them. But when it actually comes to them, my experience was that as you got closer to the day of the exercise, um, senior people uh, or their PAs would start phoning up saying they were terribly sorry, but on that day they were not going to be available and nominating somebody else. And here you really need the, um, the voice from the top, from the CEO, for example, and I was lucky in that respect. The CEO says to uh, his senior executives, no, this is not voluntary, this is compulsory, it's very important for the company. But unfortunately, again, many companies are not, not at that degree of sophistication. So uh, absolutely, but I, I think I think the culture is changing, uh, and somewhat in certain sectors by force, but somewhat you know by a clear, genuine need that people see and they're responding to it. So one thing just to add to it as well, Richard, what we did was that the approach is rigorous enough where we engage the audience, uh, and this is this is a small group of people, of course. It's it's the the senior elite of the management 
but still um, very valuable in terms of their input, of course. So we engage them uh, on a certain set of questions that we take them through just for very kind of, you know, um, Likert scale type input um, um, as their responses to the scenarios. And then we use that data to then put together a, a brief from the entire exercise to then follow up um, and just highlight various best practices and various norms and standards and key issues, you know, based on what we've found. Um, and that, that briefing is just meant to serve, you know, perhaps as a uh, reflection on the internal kind of strategy and what areas perhaps that could be improved, what areas perhaps they are keeping up with best practices and what areas perhaps may need a follow on uh, kind of intervention and so on. So for example, just to give you one example, I think we do prepare, as you said earlier, um, very well, depending on, this, on the sector. Certain sectors are more regulated, more mature. Uh, certain other sectors are simply just catching up. Um, so if you take the financial services, that's a very different ball game to the maritime industry where things are still just um, you know, being formed and put in place. So we were very conscious of risk on, of people's understanding of risk ownership and as to whether they are aware of the regulators and what their requirements are, uh, whether they're aware of um, where if there are state actors involved or even organized non-state actors potentially as threat actors, then maybe they need to work with authorities and the local cybersecurity agency to then um, follow up. So we are able to help with that in a sense. So I think the exercise towards the end becomes, uh, you know, slightly more prescriptive, but the actual interaction itself is left open with only a guided discussion really around certain themes. And this is very important. I think this journey, this learning curve for a lot of the management needs to be self-led. And all we're doing is a facilitation, but you know, exactly in a comfortable closed setting where at least they're able to be creative, they're able to challenge certain norms and standards. Um, uh, and of course, um, you know, ultimately, you know, to, to, to kind of, derive the value, you know, from the method um, that we've uh, kind of put together. So yeah, so I'm, I'm looking forward to working on more case studies um, for this as well, but equally uh, very happy to welcome any, any thoughts as well as to, um, you know, what, um, what some of the key elements perhaps we need to explore uh, to work with uh, uh, different organizations. Absolutely. And uh, please um, do contribute to the chat if you've got thoughts on anything we've been saying. I, I wanted to ask you a little bit, uh, Siraj, to go into the, the scenarios and the scenario building. Um, my experience has been that very often uh, an exercise might contain over a day, let's say two or three or four um, evolutions of a scenario. So the thing develops as it goes along. Um, and I've had experience in the past of, uh, of uh, senior executives saying, well, that's all very well, but this would never happen in real life. And, and my story there, my anecdote there is one chap uh, who was a CFO in a large company um, who bitterly resented having to do these exercises and poo pooed them all the time. A couple of years later, he became CEO of a major company in Europe. And he actually dropped me a line to thank me because he said, I always thought it was a complete waste of time. But when I was confronted with what actually for him was a very serious crisis, um, all the lessons I'd learned, not so much about the scenario itself, because of course they vary, but just the general principles of the planning, knowing who to speak to and particularly who to speak to in government. These are really key elements to, uh, to, to learn. But sorry, talk a little bit about how you, you built the scenarios. And again, I, I suspect they're tailored. That's right. So the fundamental kind of, you know, underlying philosophy here, Richard, is that scenarios need to push the boundaries to fictional yet plausible. Uh, and every sector is different. So we research the sector. We research on the organization's key footprints um, and we research uh, comparable incidents that, that are targeting 
comparable organizations. Um, and there's a lot of um, threat intelligence now in terms of the threats, but also the incidents as well that have happened and kind of post incident reports and forensic reports and so on. So there's a lot of material now that is built up through um, uh, open uh, source uh, kind of, you know, sources. So we then are very careful with our uh, choice of words uh, because we don't want value laden words to be used in the scenarios. We, once again, as I said, we, the scenarios are largely descriptive uh, with somewhat a hint uh, around certain emphases that we wanna kind of point out uh, to, to the um, uh, uh, colleagues taking part. And then also the, the way the scenarios evolve, uh, Richard, they evolve with um, some understanding, some early research and understanding of how the digital architecture, the service arch architecture of those organizations uh, kind of works. And we um, make reference to technical um, uh, details of the attack vectors, but once again, to the point where we don't get lost in the technical detail, because that is not of key interest there. That may become a potential insightful kind of, you know, a topic of discussion, uh, and it may be very relevant. So one, one example, for example, is the, the ransomware uh, and the tactics around ransomware and how organizations respond to ransomware. So that's one very good example where we, we tend to now these days dive into the, the technical details and how perhaps we are better positioned against them. Um, and then uh, we then develop those scenarios. So the whole story evolves in a way where we push the organization to consider how they would manage the risk ownership and the, the changing nature of risk ownership perhaps as the scenarios evolve, the changing nature of risks. And so we're very careful to um, play into the, 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 the risk categories that I uh, kind of mentioned. Uh, and then of course, uh, also to kind of probe them around uh, media and PR and their approach to communication uh, around those incidents, approach to external stakeholders that they may react to, approach to external suppliers uh, in the IT and security industry who may they rely on for certain forensic investigation or for other kind of management, post-incident management uh, and, and recovery. And so a number of these things I think come together. Now that, as you can imagine, takes a lot of work but then is very valuable and insightful, hopefully, to the target audience. So that's, that's our broad approach, if that helps. Thanks, right. Sorry, while you were speaking there, I was just uh, checking out, there are a number of uh, comments on the, uh, on the chat, and, and um, let me just feed them in at this point. Uh, Ludovic, hi Ludovic, very nice to be in touch with you again, it's been a while. But Ludovic has uh, made some comments on the chat, uh, useful comments about um, publications um, on the situation in France, um, maybe some problems with availability in English, but uh, but he's also put up a number of links which look really useful. So Ludovic, thank you for that. Um, Rehman Zafar has um, asked a couple of questions, which actually may be relevant at this point, uh, Siraj. The first one That's is, right. uh, can these exercises identify policy changes for corporations? Um, what are the outputs and takeaways from these exercises for management? So perhaps you'd like to address those. Yes, please. So, so the policy changes, so whether they're policy or strategy, absolutely. And I think one of the key purposes here is for management is to, is to enable the management to reflect on what would work and rehearse that thinking and strategy using the scenarios and perhaps then draw some reflection on how that may need revision, how perhaps there may be a better way of doing it, uh, or, or perhaps there are clear gaps in certain technical areas or certain aspects of the organization, or maybe financial risks or environmental risks that they haven't uh, considered. So we definitely hope that there is a very strong reflection on those policy and strategy changes. Absolutely. And I think that that's, um, and that's why they, they also need to be, as I say, a, a regular kind of a, a ritual for organizations to adopt even internally because um, 
the scenarios could evolve and shift every time, you know, potentially. So then they are encountering a number of different kind of, you know, flavors of it and, and, and pushing the strategy piece in a different uh, set of ways. In terms of um, outputs and takeaways, so we, we do a briefing document. Uh, the actual value of the discussion on the day and the reflection on the scenarios and particularly the risk categories and the risk ownership areas that we push them on that i think is very important because you know that's one of the key takeaways because the value that, that they get as a team to come together and focus their attention that's either going to signal that they have a very well rehearsed strategy in place that they're all bought into it that they all know wh wh what the roles are and importantly they all can think of and commit to a set of financial and material resources which will be needed at the point you know when an incident is finally discovered and established um and the post event briefing then just helps them to do more medium to longer term um kind of you know planning and and reflection and so i think that would be tailored and this is also where we bring in some value because we would then research on certain areas which may have come up. So one of the things you may recall, Richard, is that in our interactions with the organization that we worked with, there were questions that perhaps came about um, not being, nothing directly relevant to the scenario, but they came up, perhaps they came about because they someone had been thinking about certain types of threats or they had encountered something. And so that's very refreshing because people are thinking and they're thinking just beyond the scenarios even. So that just shows the value immediately of, you know, just getting people together and just, you know, opening up that, you know, kind of um, uh, uh, room for uh, a comfortable conversation. So, yeah, so there is that, you know, um, aftermath um, as well, um, the, the after briefing, after event briefing as well, um, that we value. One, one other um, question, I think, um, Richard, that uh, Ludovic mentioned. So in terms of other um, exercises, I just just briefly just highlight this. So the idea of uh, doing um, incident response planning through exercises and looking at cybersecurity drills and so on is now somewhat mature to a point where there are a number of different offerings in the market. Ours is unique in a in a couple of ways. One is we are targeting um, the senior management, the boards in the corporate kind of world because we our research led on to this notion of kind of under preparation, you know, and under um, uh, kind of capacity in that particular market. And we have developed the scenarios and the business risk classifications and everything else pretty, pretty much with that audience in mind. So this is not a reworked version of some other drill that we'll just pull into, uh, you know, uh, for, for this audience. I think this is very important to understand that because a lot of other drills and capture the flag exercises and, and so on are very technical in nature um, with a very different purpose in mind, I would say you know, still incident response, but, you know, at a different level. Two, and this is very important, uh, the, the approach in itself uh, leads up to a, a good capacity assessment framework. Depending on the organization's needs, especially if they want to commit to it in a more regular fashion, then I think this provides for a, a very good way of them to internally benchmark their capacity um, and then to then maybe open it up to more mid mid tier management in the organization depending on the size of the organization so i think that's a big strength um, that we offer um, that i think you know perhaps you know there is more room to develop as well as we work more and more we we definitely aim to do that you know kind of evolve the approach as well uh, and so on I'm just going to make a couple of comments as you were speaking, Suraj. The, the, the first one is that very often these um, uh, cybersecurity exercises, and I've been the victim of some of them in companies where I've worked, 
uh, produced perhaps by the big four, among others, you, you'd rather get the feeling of being put through a series of hoops um, and that you get a medal at the end of having survived it, rather than it being uh, something more cerebral, where you're actually thinking through and uh, talking with colleagues, as you said, emphasized before, very importantly, in that private way, um, the, uh, the, the chance to say, hey, actually, there's a better way that we could be doing this internally. So I think that the, the other thing, just about levels of these exercises, um, my experience, although I'm willing to be corrected, is that usually at the technical level, um, the performance is pretty good. The, the technicians uh, doing the disaster recovery, for example, um, are usually you know, good at their jobs and they do it that's well. Right, yeah, right. um, the exception to that perhaps is in cases, and I, I lived this through the, the Arab Spring experience, um, where if you're working for a large company, which is grown fast through acquisition, for example, um, the people, who are the, the technicians who are sitting at group or even the technicians in the local market, if they're a new acquisition, may not be fully aware of all the, uh, the connections that there are uh, between different systems within the group. And certainly in the Arab Spring context with, with Egypt, I'm thinking specifically, um, that caused real problems at the technical level. At the senior level, however, um, things, all, all sorts of lessons were learned, as you say. Um, yeah, I think the, the increasing hyperconnectivity, I think, is a big challenge, absolutely. All right, and just um, more, more comments are coming in. Ludovic, thank you. You've organized, uh, excuse me, you've put up um, a link uh, for the organization of conferences. Um, Kurosh has commented, uh, in the age of the internet and with the disappearance of physical borders, our approach to security must change and evolve towards a ubiquitous defense approach that's both holistic and targeted. Couldn't agree more with that. Holistic's one of my magic words at the Oxford Cyber Academy, uh, very strongly. Uh, agree with that. Any comment from you, Siraj? I think I would just say that um, I was just reflecting on uh, the potential of state or even non-state actors in being involved. And I think increasingly for organizations, um, one of the biggest challenges here is attribution, uh, given the asymmetric nature of uh, cyber attacks and of course given the sensitivity around it no organization would just want to jump up and say the state a or state b seems to have you know uh, um, initiated this so i think that becomes a big uh, kind of a, a challenge uh, when when you have the media you know kind of building up on the hype as well sometimes and so on uh, and and this to, to this point about the borders are breaking down and and so we need to consider that holistically and two of course is uh in terms of any legal uh and kind of more regulatory um kind of you know uh follow up to depending on the nature of the incident um it is a challenge because very often if if there's a, a very well-defined regulation that regulates that reporting and so on that's fine but when it comes to more deeper incident management or any forensics or so on then for at a certain stage i think the jurisdiction the legal jurisdiction as to where perhaps um you know uh this sits uh, and also then any diplomatic and international uh, kind of implications on the organization's um kind of presence especially for large-scale organizations where they may have presence, I think uh, maybe a particular challenge. We see this now with the current Ukrainian, uh, you know, situation where, unfortunately, there are certain organizations they that are operating in the region, but are ha now having to manage, you know, their kind of rollback very carefully, um, because this absolutely sprung up on them with no, uh, uh, you know, preparation and also the way um now the, the 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 kind of response to this in terms of the some of the um sanctions and 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 so on would mean that organizations would have to manage that very carefully or or even any follow up to this potentially any reaction that you may get from activists or non state actors that may be in a certain region that may initiate uh, you know, any any uh, compliance with the sections. So, uh, yeah, I think that is definitely a, a challenge uh, which we need to think holistically, for sure. Yeah, well, certainly since uh, Ukraine kicked off or, or perhaps even slightly before, there's been a lot of 
discussion in the in the professional literature about uh, the the extent to which security people actually should have uh, had a bigger voice in warning about overdependence in supply chain um, on certain countries, Russia and China being being the obvious one. Uh, of course, everybody at the moment is being wise after the event. That's uh, that's always very easy. But um, interesting discussions going on, particularly in America, of course, as you would expect, but about um, the need for boards to be thinking about their dependence, for example, on China, um, whether if you're a Western company, you, you want to be too far down that route in case all of this happens again in a different form. So, yes, yeah, some interesting, interesting discussions still going on about all of that. Indeed, I think the, the supply chain uh, kind of challenges that we are looking at, uh, both due to COVID, and the, this, 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 the whole kind of, you know, um, uh, restarting of the manufacturing lines, assembly lines and, and the supply chains, but also in certain areas like the semiconductor industry is facing huge shortages. So how do we then manage that? Uh, I mean, you know, certainly for semiconductors, Richard, it's not a straightforward exercise just to set up another fabrication uh, kind of, you know, uh, facilities that it needs significant amounts of investment, significant amounts of commitment and uh, kind of knowledge uh, underpinning. Um, and so, yes, these are some very serious questions which we'll have to kind of grapple and organizations of all shapes and sizes are in the middle of it. <laughs> yes, in indeed. Um, sorry, so I'm just going to uh, comment. There's one uh, question on the Q&A again from, from Kurosh, if I can just uh, read it. Um, our approach of anticipation and organization being more and more standardized, this makes us predictable and circumventable by predators who are more and more professional. As a result, our perimetric analysis and defense approach becomes obsolete and ineffective. Which risk management approach to adapt, given that currently attack methodology is more and more multiple, complex, multidisciplinary, indirect, multidimensional, and via multiple vectors? Well, well, there's a simple question to answer in 30 seconds. <laughs> we could have so, a whole webinar on that. Yes, absolutely. I just want to say, so going back to the scenarios, I, I said that we are trying to push boundaries and they are fictional settings, but yet plausible settings. I think that is an advantage there. We need to start um, pushing our kind of creative uh, powers to consider uh, attack vectors that may be realized, you know, which may have escaped traditional risk assessment. Um, and how we do that, I think, once again, the, the best way to do this is to, one, get, this, get the, the, the top-down leadership in a room or come together in a, whether in a virtual room or a physical room, get them to focus on certain aspects and then to commit to uh, seriously thinking about how we would react to them. So one of the questions here, and in, in just in response to that, and I think Richard, I'm sure you would have seen this as well. A lot of the awareness campaigns and awareness material is very good and sometimes prescriptive as well as to what perhaps what the remedies are but it doesn't really solve the problem because every organization is different. Um, the level of resource commitment is variable. Um, the security still has a weaker business case comparatively to uh, many other you know, technical and service improvement areas. So we can have a situation where the management may be very well placed, uh, the business may be very well uh, structured to uh, be resilient to any incidents, but um, the resource commitment, I think, has to come. And one of my hidden agendas, as it were, <laughs> as a, a, you know, as a mission for me, is to enable organizations to commit more resource, is to take this more seriously, uh, not just from a operational governance point of view, but from a financial point of view. Uh, and so we can't escape that, particularly now when the economic pressures are high, but unfortunately, the uncertainty, the political uncertainty, is also high, and this, these are the kind of these are the, the kind of well timelines or, or phases in history where most disruption happened, unfortunately, and the the, the kind of you know uh, potential kind of victims and targets of these attacks, you know, would um, would would uh, you know would would become clear. So. Uh, yeah, I think that's that's my mission in a, in a sense, to help security raise its business case as well. 
Absolutely, amen to that. And uh, you took me back immediately to my experiences, old but also very recent. And, and the fact is that um, confronted with uh, a case for cyber investment, a board is generally speaking going to be thinking of spending money on things, on technology. And of course, that's important. Of course, you've got to have the, the, the right kit, the most up-to-date kit um, possible. But behind that, there is all of that, as it were, soft area to do with security awareness. If you think of the, the vast majority of cyber incidents actually having at some point a human component, uh, because some, some person has done the wrong thing unwittingly, occasionally deliberately, but generally unwittingly through lack of training or, or awareness. Um, money needs to be spent in that area too. And in earlier episodes of this uh, webinar series, we've, we've had actually some quite interesting conversations, even with um, Professor Phil Morgan at Cardiff University on behavioral psychology and how it can be applied to helping people to do the right thing. Um, I remember as a security director, we're now going back six or seven years, um, we were very primitive. There, there were certain lessons that were taught on, on machines uh, that people had to do once a year uh, to tick the box on their HR record. And actually it made no difference to their awareness whatsoever. We need to get more sophisticated. We are getting more sophisticated, but money needs to be invested in that area too. So yes, very much agree with you. Yeah, um, uh, I think uh, there are some more questions and comments. Very happy to, yep, for you too, Richard. Uh, so Ludovic is, sorry, I don't want to miss anybody out. We did that one. Uh, Ludovic, technologies are becoming more and more complex. And one of the major problems is implementation, which can lead to altering the overall level of cybersecurity and increase the potential attack surface. Do you think that asking solution providers to strengthen the security of their developments is one of the possible solutions, as the White House did in the US a few months ago with the letter from President Biden? So if I may read this question in a slightly different way, and hopefully uh, still address it, is how much, how much exposed are we due to the, the weaker supply chains that we rely on? Uh, increasingly, if you take certain uh, industries, take automotive for, as an example, Richard, um, an automotive system, the ultimate on-road final product, is as exposed as its supply chain. So it's, it's a classic example of an engineered product that's relying on 100, 200 suppliers from all over the world um, and who and that supply chain is very competitive. It's a very competitive industry. So they're focused on reducing cost. Uh, and so that reduction cost means potential for cutting corners or potential for reusing ob objects and components and subsystems in some you know, uh, unprofessional ways or, or whatever. And so we, we need to really seriously consider as to how as a sector for any organization, how is a sector you know, they are enabled, given their supplier ecosystem, uh, to then deliver on the best of security, whether in terms of its products and services. So one of the uh, scenarios, one of the elements of the scenarios, and you may recall this, Richard, um, had a very clear stakeholder kind of a link to the supplier of, the, of a certain technology to the organization. And there are in interesting tensions, uh, you know, in those relationships because naturally there's a tendency to shift that liability and that burden on one another. So the supplier may argue, well, you know, what we provide you is very well specified and designed, but it's how you assemble it and integrate it in your final product. Equally, the, the final manufacturer, the OEM, the integrator may come back to the supplier and say, look, well, this doesn't fit our needs or this perhaps ignores a certain you know, threat or a risk profile. So it's, that's why it's a very complex issue. And I think I completely agree uh, with the comment here that yes, the org serious organizations, particularly those uh, building products, building complex products and relying on um, um, kind of a, a, a complex supply chain have to engage with their uh, supplier base, but also one of the purposes going back to the exercise that we did, if you recall, Richard, was to then help the organizations prepare for a world where they only have limited influence on the supply chain. So they will have to think of strategies as to how they manage that. 
you know, and if you talk to the insurers, they would tell you that increasingly organizations are talking to them about corporate product liability. And that corporate product liability is exactly what a lot of organizations should be worried about. You know, if they are delivering on products that are relying on supply chains that they have limited influence on. So this is the kind of world we are now faced with. And I think, if anything, this tells us that we need to be better prepared. And my mission really is to help with that risk perception. And as a result of that risk perception, effective risk perception, organizations should see clear risks, um, you know, arising out of potential incidents. And as a result, then, you know, strengthen the business case for security uh, and reinforce whether it's policies, whether it's strategies, whether it's the, the soft side of, you know, the culture, uh, and of course, uh, the more tangible things as well. I very much agree with that. Now, we've almost reached the hour. In fact, we have one minute left, but I wanted to leave that one minute for uh, a question from Rechman. Um, could these exercises that we've been talking about be conducted for multiple companies at the same time, or are they just tailored to a specific single organization at a time? That's a very good question. That's very relevant to what I just said, because um, if an organization is uh, very well uh, plugged into their suppliers, then it may be that this is done at a sectoral level. And if this is done at a sectoral level, then I think for this to be more effective and valuable to everyone involved, perhaps the, the, the multiple organizations that are involved in the exercise um, you know, uh, could ag agree on some non-disclosure element or some Chatham House rules where everything said is then staying within that room to make sure that everyone's kind of covered in that sense. So it depends on existing relationships that are there between organizations and their suppliers. It depends on different sectoral um, kind of, you know, practices and, and kind of norms. Um, there are uh, incident uh, sharing uh, communities uh, now set up in certain areas, but they are only about incident sharing. They're not about kind of incident reflection and you know more deeper um, kind of you know strategy uh, kind of forming and so on, which is what we enable. So absolutely, I think the answer is yes. We just depends on you know how we configure uh, that audience. Right. Well, at this point, I really must wrap up because we're exactly on the hour. So, Suresh, very many thanks for a really interesting session, and uh, always a pleasure to talk with you. Of course. Um, to any of you in the audience who would be interested in, in hearing more about uh, the work that Siraj is doing and the development of these exercises and so on, um, please drop us a line. You should find our email contact details at the beginning of the chat. And we'd be very interested to talk to you because, um, as you would have learned from Siraj's comments, this is an area where we're learning all the time and really, really uh, keen to, to get better experience in dealing with a range of different companies. So please do contact us. And with that, very many thanks uh, for attending and um, we'll see you next time. Look on LinkedIn for the next Oxford Cyber Academy webinar. Thank you. Thank you indeed. Thank you.